All right, welcome back. Tobias and I want to thank you again for spending some time with us today. And uh, we want to continue our discussion on querying, but I'm going to use that term loosely for this module uh, in SQL Server 2012. We've been talking about for five modules now, the idea of querying content. We're going to kind of shift a little bit to uh, talking a little bit about inserting and updating data and how we can kind of protect that data as we're inserting and updating that data. So we're going to look here, inserts, updates, deletes. We're going to talk about the use of defaults, constraints, and triggers. So remember one of the big things that we want is we want to make sure that we're retrieving content. Uh, and we've talked about several modules of how we're going to do that. But we want to make sure when we're adding content that we understand that the old GGO, garbage in, garbage out. So if we don't have things like constraints and we don't have data uh, integrity uh, 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 procedures in place, that when we retrieve content, it may not be valid content. So we're going to look at ways for inserting, updating, deleting content, validating that content the best we can to make sure we've got good content that's going in. So we do perform some of these tasks that we've been talking about in the previous modules. We've got good stuff coming back out, not garbage like we, so, like we had talked about. So we want to avoid the garbage in, garbage out. We're going to take a look at that in this module here. What we've been talking about are DD, uh, DML statements. This should be DML as well. Let me see what this is. Yeah, this should be DML statements. DML statements are data manipulation statements. So querying using a select statement is a DML. This is also a DML. We're going to talk about inserts and updates and deletes. DD hour statements where we create objects or modify objects or alter objects. So this should be DML instead of DDL. But uh, we're going to talk about DML statements, continue to talk about DML statements because a select statement is a DML as well. So let's take a look at how we get content in there. So again, one of our concerns is we want to avoid the garbage in and the garbage out. So we're going to look at ways we can do that. Now we're going to add content. This is a pretty straightforward insert into statement. We're going to insert into production.unitMeasure. If we don't know the name of the columns or we don't want to supply the name or the values in any certain orders, we supply the column names. So if we looked at the unit measure, there's name, there's unit measure code, there's modified date. If I did a select asterisk from unit measure, it's actually unit measure code, then name, and modified date. That's actually how it's stored in the content. But if we want to apply values to, to the columns, they don't have to be in any certain order as long as we include the column headers. And that's what we've done in the, in the top example right here. Now, another way we can add content is insert into. And we can, so this is inserting just a, a basic row. And notice what we're doing here. We're, we're adding a value in the name column called square yards. And the unit measure code is Y2. And, this, and the modified date, we're actually retrieving the system date. We're not going to, we could hard code a date in there, but we're actually retrieving the, the system date. This is adding just a single row. We can add multiple rows using a similar statement. But under values, what we're going to do is we're going to add multiple occurrences of the value. Now we're adding square feet and square inches. And we're going to use F2 and uh, I2 for inches. So this is uh, the, the squaring of those types of, uh, of measurements here. So that's how we can insert some of the data. We can also use what's called an insert into the, the content. But now instead of supplying the values, we're going to use a select statement. So it's an insert select option. And what we're going to do to populate this name and unit measure code and modified date, we're going to select name, unit measure code, and modified date from, we'll say, a temporary unit table that, was ex that exists out there. So we're going to take the content using a select statement, and we're going to populate that into the unit measure content uh, 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 table. Excuse me. And we don't have to grab everything. Because we're using a select statement, we could say we only want to insert the content from January 1st, 2008. The good news about this class is I'm going to learn to understand these timestamps in reverse order. That's my goal. So this is January 1st, 2008, and we're going to only add content that's less than that. Anything older than that, we're not going to add that content. So we still have control of what content gets added. The insert into the execute statement, we're going to insert into these three columns again. But this time, instead, we're going to execute a store procedure. And we're going to pass it some variables, the number of rows 5 and a category ID of 1. And that's going to execute our only insert content into this table that meets the only five rows as long as category ID is equal to 1. So again, we're controlling what content that we're adding into the tables. And that's a big deal to make sure that we're not adding that garbage in. We can also perform a select into. Again, we're going to do a select name, unit measure code, and modify date into. So now we're taking content into a temporary table. So back in slide or two before, I wanted to use a temporary table. I could have created the temporary table from content that's inside the unit measure table. I could do a select name and unit measure code and modify date, which are columns within 
the, the unit measure table right here. And I'm going to select them and insert them into a new table called temp UOM table. And again, I'm going to be specific about what contents ordered in there or are populated in there because I'm going to put where war order date is, in, uh, is before to, uh, January 1st of 2008. So again, controlling what I'm doing when I'm adding content in there. Now, one of the things we may want to do is create what's called an identity column. An identity column allows me to create a column that I don't need to populate myself. I decide what items or what numbers I want in there. So what I do is I create an integer value. I think we've got here, yeah, we've got product ID, int, identity, and then we identify what's called the, the seed and the increment value. By default, it's one and one. So if I don't specify this, it's one and one. So the very first row I insert is going to get product ID number one. The second row is going to get number two. The third row is going to get number three. In the US, whether you use Fahrenheit or Celsius, the next row is going to be number four. It doesn't really matter. But what we can do differently here is we can say we want the, the, the seed to start at 100 instead of one. And instead of incrementing by one, we're going to increment by 10. First row will be 100 then 110, then 120, then 130, and then it's going to populate that information automatically for me instead of me having to supply that identity column. So it's a way for us to automatically generate a number and have that number populated for me with me defining the increment value and that seed value where I start with. Now this is set up on a table level. Another option that is the sequences option. This is new in SQL Server 2012. This allows me to create it for the database. So this is going to create sequence called invoice sequence as an integer. And here's my C value, start with five. And here's my increment value, start with five, or increment by five, excuse me. So wherever I use this, invoice.suq, it's going to start, the first row is going to be added as five, the next row will be 10, 15, 20, et cetera. And then if I want to retrieve information, like what's the, what's the last number that was used, I can select next value for dbo.invoice sequence. So the last number used was 25, the next value would be 30. If I'm quick with math, I can do 25 or 30 minus 5 is the 25. So this would retrieve what the next value is going to be used that's going to be populated using this sequences option, which again, new to 2012 and set up more instead of a table level like the identity, it's set up at the database level. Now, ways for us to modify content. We might store content in SQL Server and realize, oops, I shouldn't have done it that way or I need to change that. We have the update statement. All right. Now we've got to be careful about this. Update production dot unit measure set modified date equal get to date a get date. Now if I stopped right there and just executed this statement, what have I just done? I've actually updated every row in the unit measure column uh, uh, table to set the modified date to today's date. What I need to do is specifically be more careful about is making sure we supply a where clause. Where unit measure code equal M2. Now it's going to only go to that M2, the square miles uh, uh, row, and it's going to set the modified date to today's date because we're using a, the uh, system uh, value here uh, function to get today's date and populate that. Again, be very cautious when you're doing update to make sure you supply a where clause unless you want every row to be updated. Very similar to that, we have something, another way to we can modify data is called the merge. Now this is where I can use a merge to modify data based on any of the following conditions. Source matches the target, source has no match in a target, or when the target has no match in a source. So this is a nice way for us to be able to update content within a, 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 a database. Yeah, I thought we'd uh, do a bit of a demo, just look at look at merge uh, and I will do somewhat of a stray thing to, to just show a bit uh, of the XML functionality we have as well in the product because it, um, it, it kind of fits nicely in this, uh, in this particular topic. So bear me, with me a little bit so we get a, a kind of an interesting example going. We, we swapped out his keyboard by the way because the other one burnt out so <laughs> we should be good to go for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. You don't have carpal tunnel or anything, dude. I don't think you have time for carpal tunnel. I think your nerves don't even. <laughs> okay, so let's say that um, what I want to do is I want to be retrieve products in XML format, and later I want to be able to grab that XML being passed from the client and actually update a set of products, uh, update or insert a set of products based on this XML definition. So I'll start with just uh, simplifying the table a little bit so it does, it's not uh, so complicated for me to just uh, perform the insert because it's so many columns in here. So I'll just grab product ID and let's say name and that, that's going to be enough for me. Um, 
And I'll use this into uh, keyword. And uh, just to be clear, earlier we, we had examples where the tables were called temp something. They weren't necessarily temp tables, which is, which is something differently, um, or something different. So I'll just call this uh, table um, just, uh, just products. Uh, so I'm just stealing these two columns and putting them in this table. Now, let's start by grabbing this as XML. So I want to grab all columns, or all products rather, um, where the, the name starts with an A, let's say, as a, uh, as a filter. Okay, good, three of them. Uh, and I would like this, uh, again, returned as XML. So I'll say for XML, and the best, uh, what you typically use is for XML path. There's for XML raw, auto, uh, explicit and path, but path is the more more powerful one. Um, now, why would you like to return anything as XML? It turns out it's very practical format for interchange between between systems. So, if you want to pass a set from SQL Server to something else, uh, XML is is one of the good formats to use. It's it, we get a common ask if we support JSON uh, format, which we don't do yet. Obviously, you can convert XML into JSON and and the reverse on the client side. Um, so anyway, at any rate, I'll say, okay, grab me this, and for each row, I want to generate an uh, element called product. And I want the root element at, uh, at the root uh, called, let's say, products. So by default, um, for XML path, root, oh, and uh, let's have the asterisk in there. So now you can see I get some sort of XML document back, and this is the default structure I get. So this you can see, for every row I get one of those, and I get one of the, uh, this root thing uh, generated as per my uh, for XML clause. And you can see by default I get one element, this is called an element in XML, uh, for each column. But I can call, uh, name them a bit differently to uh, basically change the format. So I'll call this one you know, um, ID. And the at sign means that I would like it to be an attribute rather than an element. And why I use the, these uh, quotation marks is just because the at sign has a, a meaning in, in, in SQL, right? Uh, so it's a delimited identifier. And I want the name just like this. Why I make everything lowercase is by definition XML is case sensitive. So for me at least it simplifies if everything is lowercase. And now the, the XML uh, that I'm getting back looks like this, okay? So you can see it's, it's actually clean. fairly simple to uh, retrieve an XML document. You can do more elaborate things with subqueries and create uh, tree structures as well, but this kind of gets you started. So now we grab the data. Now I want to look at what if I want to use this as a way to insert new data into the table or update data. So let's say we're passing this back into the server and we actually have a, a data type called XML. So we'll say, okay, um, this, which we support ex, uh, implicit casting to and from string. So I pass this into the server, and let's add a new product. And I don't know what ID it's going to get because there, is, well, there isn't an identity in there. So let me actually just put it in. So 10,000, 100,000, <laughs> Tobias. Okay, so this is a new one. And let's say we want to update this, so we'll add an exclamation mark at the end of these three. So just seeing now I pass this string to the server, it parses it into an XML structure internally, and then I can go and query it. So now we're doing the reverse. Before I generated XML from, a, from my result set, uh, going from tabular to, to XML, now I'm going doing the reverse. So I'll do select star from my XML variable, and it has a few methods to it, and nodes is one of the interesting ones. So basically say, hey, go and look for this um, XPath expression, which is kind of like uh, select against um, uh, the from and where clause, made basically against uh, uh, an XML structure. So basically this says, for each product, find on the product found on the products, give me a row back. And we'll call this XT, as the, the set is called XT, and it will re return one column which includes the XML element, which I'll call XC, so the column. So now I can say, okay, XT.XC.value, and I can use this to go into the product element and grab things. So I'll go and say, well, I would like to grab the ID attribute, and I would like you to grab this as an integer, and I'll call this product ID. 
And I would also like you to go into the element and grab me the name attribute and return this as, I don't know, mvarchar1000, let's say, as name. So let's just go ahead and execute this and I'll go ahead and just comment out what I have above here. Okay, so again, I pass in the structure, I say grab me each ele product element from products and return this. Ah, okay, nice. nice. I can now parse this XML nicely and now I have a set. So now, hmm, what if I could use the merge statement to actually merge this data from the XML structure into the table? So I'll say merge into uh, products, I guess the table was, called uh, as this is the destination, right? Yeah using my XML variable, and now I would have to paste this whole in thing in there, but since we know about common table expressions, I could just say, well, let's call this one source, or SRC. So now I have a common table expression called SRC. So I say using SRC, so now I'm joining the table with my XML uh, document on SRC.productID equals uh, destination product ID. And then I can start using these various events that we will go through uh, in the merge statement. So basically I can say when, uh, I think it's not matched. So if the product ID is not found in the destination, then I would like to insert obviously. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, okay, go ahead and insert uh, into obviously the, the destination. So I don't say anything other than the uh, column name. So in insert to product ID and name the values Destination dot product ID or sorry, source product ID, comma source name. Okay, so when it doesn't find it, it inserts, and then when matched, I would like it to update. So update the source set, uh, and product ID obviously can't change. So set name equal to source product ID, and obviously I have uh, no. That seems great. Okay, let's see if this works. Oh, it is an identity. identity yeah, it is an identity yeah. column. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Let's, uh, let's just not include the product ID then. And let's not include it up in the XML either. So. And there we go. Nice. So now it actually added these and we can go and select, run the select statement from the table again for the XML, to grab the XML and I'll say like A or name like Tobias. Let's just say Tob. So we get that row as well. And now you can see that the exclamation marks are in there and Tobias was added. The final thing I wanted to show which uh, gets it a bit extra interesting is um, We'll get, we'll, let's get the correct Tobias value in there. So I got a thousand. Okay, cool. So ID equals 1000. Let's say I wanted to delete as well. So let's say, okay, I want to delete this AWC logo cap. H how would I do this? We have something support where you can say when not matched in source. That's very dangerous because that means if it's not in this set, then remove it. Yeah which obviously then would remove all other products. So what I could do instead is I can add another attribute and say, um, call it delete. And I'll say delete equals true. So I would like to delete this one. We'll say we'll grab that from the XML document as well and say, well, grab the delete field as a bit. And I'll call it do delete as delete is a reserved keyword. So now I'm grabbing if it should be deleted or not. And I can just say, if it's not found, obviously we'll return null. So I'll just say, okay, if it doesn't, if it returns null, then we'll say uh, false, right? Do delete. And now I can say when matched, then this. When not matched, then, uh, sorry, when matched and do delete equals one. Then delete. Right? So I can actually have more complex expressions in the when clause yeah. rather than just say matched or not matched. Obviously, the other one has to be the opposite, right? So we should say here, well, sure. if it's zero, 
then uh, don't uh, then uh, then update. So we'll go ahead and try and execute this. Seems to work, right? So again, not matched insert, not matched and do delete false update, or matched and do delete false update, and then matched and do delete one, then delete. And now if we query, we can see that the row was deleted. Yes, nice. So then you got a bit of an intro into what you can do with XML in, in SQL Server 2012 as well. Very nice. Now, I mean, there are other ways that we can delete content that's probably not quite as complicated as writing, but if you're not in the need for XML, uh, we can use a delete statement. Um, I know it wasn't as, it's not as fun and cool as what Tobias just did, but we could just do a delete from the table. And again, very critical, just like the update clause, if you don't have a where clause, if I did a delete from production.unitmeasure, what am I going to delete without a where clause? What's going to be deleted? You got it, everything. So we want to be careful about that. Pretty much whenever you use an update and a delete, you're going to want to use a where clause uh, just because you want to avoid what I call RPEs, resume producing events. So you want to make sure you don't get uh, have to generate a new resume because you deleted 40,000 rows of really valuable information. So delete from whatever the table is where unit measure equal and uh, specify the criteria that you want to meet in order for uh, that row to be deleted. Now you may want to delete everything from a table. Now, one way to do that is use this delete clause statement without a where clause. Another way to do this, but if you do it this way, by the way, this is logged in your transaction log. If you use the truncate table to remove all data, we're going to truncate the table. That means pretty much don't delete the table, but take all of the data out of the table. All right. And the good thing about this is not going to write every row to the, or there's minimal logging for the information that's being written to the transaction log. So it'll go much faster if you have 40, 50, 60, 70, thousand rows in there. Uh, it'll be a little bit faster for you to be able to do, uh, delete that. Well, especially, if, let's say you have a million five rows. billion rows. Yeah, a billion rows. Definitely there will be a huge difference. Aren't you supposed to go five billion dollars or one? Yeah. You probably don't know that. What was that show? Uh, awesome power. Awesome power. Yeah. I will start referencing Swedish shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so we did inserts, updates, deletes with XML. Just trying to see if there's anything here. No, I think you got the cool stuff, with, especially with that merge, so that's good. Constraints and triggers. One of the things, so we looked at adding content and making sure that we can, we can add content several different ways, updating the content, deleting the content. But one of the things we need to be concerned about as well is data integrity. So what we can use when we're adding content are constraints and triggers. And what they can do for us is make sure that what we're adding is appropriate or valid. And we can also make sure that if we're adding content or updating content, that if there are other tables that need to be updated as well, we can make sure those are updated. So we can create four or five different types of constraints. We'll introduce each one of those. And we can also use uh, implement what are called triggers. So I could have an update trigger on the employee table. So on the employee trader table, if I update the last name there, I'm going, to tr I'm going to fire a trigger that's going to go out and also update the accounts payable table or the accounts receivable or payroll table. So anywhere that last name resides in my database, I can have it go out using a trigger and update every call that needs to be updated for that last name. So that's the idea of a DML trigger where I'm doing data manipulation and I'm going to use triggers. Let's talk about our constraints. We have a primary key constraint. Uh, this is very, very important when you're designing your database and your, your rows, with, your tables within the database. What this does for you is it ensures that you have uniqueness on that table. Pretty much every table you're going to use in a relational database will have a primary key on it. And that primary key is going to enforce uniqueness. Now, one of the chats that came in earlier is like, well, does a primary key have to be a composite key or can a composite key be a primary key? A, a composite key is a, a key that contains two or more columns. So absolutely, a primary key can be a composite key. A foreign key can be a, a composite key. Uh, a unique constraint could be a composite key. So a, unique, a composite key is just multiple columns are required to make that unique. Let's say, for instance, I have a driver's license. My driver's license number is 1234, and I'm, all, and I'm from Arizona. Now, Tobias also has a driver's license, and he's 1234, and he's from Washington. Well, if we put those in the same table, I can't enforce uniqueness because if we have just the primary key on the driver on the driver's license number for one two three four, the first one in is going to win. The second one says, "Sorry, we already have a one two three four. We can't play." So and I'll be first in. You don't get a driver's license. No, I'll be um, first. 
So what we'll do is we'll actually create a composite primary key. So we're going to take one, two, three, four, and we're going to concatenate on WA for Washington. And we're going to take my one, two, three, four, concatenate AZ. We'll make that a composite primary key. Now they're unique. Now they're going to use the columns together to enforce the uniqueness. Now we can work together. Now we can both be in that database. AZ is alphabetical before WA unless they do it in descending order. So I should win anyway, but that's a side note. Mm. Um, <laughs> first one in wins. So what we do is we can add a primary key to a table. It can be composite. It requires you, it enforces uniqueness for us. And uh, pretty much most tables are going to have that primary key to uh, enforce uniqueness for the values that are stored or the rows that are stored in that database or in that table. Now, in addition to that, we have what's called a foreign key. A foreign key can also be a composite key. And it's a combination of, of one or more columns that's going to allow us to reference that primary key. Okay, so we look at, for instance, the if we come down here, this is adding one here, alter a table. We're adding a constraint called a foreign key. I like to use the prefix of the type of key at the beginning. So we have primary key, we have foreign key, we have a couple more coming up. But I like to put that at the beginning so I know what type of key I'm working with. It's a foreign key. It's going to reference this table called sales reason. And it's going to reference the column over there called sales reason ID. And we're also going to talk about what happens if we try to delete that, what happens if we try to update that. We want to cascade that delete or that update. All right, so we want to make sure that that delete takes place. If it does take place, it gets cascaded. So alter table or, or foreign key is used to reference normally a, a, a primary key. It could be a unique uh, constraint, which we're going to introduce next on another table. So if I'm going in, I'm adding a new product, and one of the product, one of the items are in the product is uh, category. Well, category information is not going to be stored in that table. It's going to be stored in another table called categories. Well, over in that second table called categories, I'm going to have a primary key and category ID. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to have a foreign key in the products table that references that primary key in that categories table. And just to make sure that I'm adding valid content, it's going to reference to make sure, is there a category over there called Fruit Loops or something? I have no idea where I got with Fruit Loops, but we'll go with that one. Um, so we'll reference that to make sure it's valid data that we're adding. Now, I can only have one primary key per table. But there may be other columns in a table that I want to enforce uniqueness on. So what I can do is use a unique constraint. A unique constraint that allows me to enforce uniqueness on columns other than the primary key. So we're already going to enforce uniqueness with the state code and the driver's license. Maybe we want to make sure if social security number is going to be in there, we want to make sure you, the social security number, because that should also be unique. But my primary key has already been consumed with the driver's license and the state code. We could create a social security, uh, a, a unique constraint on that social security column to enforce the uniqueness on that column. So unique constraints are used to enforce uniqueness on columns within a table. If your already primary key is already enforced uniqueness on other tables or other uh, columns within that table. We can also introduce uh, another type of constraint called a check constraint. This enforces the type of content or the values that are being added. This here is an example of altering a table called new table. We're adding a column called zip code. It's an integer value with a null. We're going to create a, a constraint on there called check zip code. And what we're going to do is we're going to set this up to check the zip code. So when someone enters in the 05468 or whatever the zip code is, it's going to make sure that no one enters 0546P. Because this is going to make sure, no, I can't, I can't go out and say, all right, is this a valid zip code without checking against everything in the, world, in the, in the country. But it can make sure no one that slips in, accidentally, you know, puts in an alpha character or some type of symbol. And it better be an American zip code. And it better be an American zip code if we're going to be doing that. Exactly. Definitely. And probably it shouldn't be an integer. It probably should be some var chart. And var chart, chart yeah. Because now, nowadays you have the dash and the three or four other character, four other characters. And since you're using it. like, and like uh, you use on strings. So. Oh, gotcha. Exactly. Yeah. So this would enforce that. that uh, the type of data or the values being added, make sure that there's not adding any type of uh, in, uh, inappropriate content here. The last type of constraint that we're going to talk about. Do you have is examples of inappropriate content? <laughs> <laughs> I just said like 0546P, that'd be inappropriate for this column. I see, I see. Yeah, just for this column. It sounds really inappropriate. It does. <laughs> well, you were jumping, you jumped all over that one like drool on a baby. Um, <laughs> So the next and the last constraint we're going to talk about is a default constraint. If there are values, and I'm going to, so I'm probably going to get picked on by this because I'm, not, I'm, <laughs> yes. not, I'm not from Sweden. So uh, alter table, we're going to add a default constraint. The, the country region code by default is going to be USA. All right. 
Is that actually the? I thought it was U.S. That's the region code for the U.S. Uh, um, it could be. I was just. I just want. I thought you wanted a reason to say why does it have to be U.S. Why can't it be Sweden? What's the Sweden's code? Yeah. S.E. S.E. Okay. So uh, if we could add U.S. or S.E. as the default. I, I, I forgot. I was be. I was be working with him today. I would have made this S.E. <laughs> to make it safe. But uh, so instead of me having to supply when I'm doing an insert, or when instead of me having to supply the country code, it would by default. <laughs> if I don't supply S.E. for instance, it would by default populate that with U.S.A. So it just makes it a little bit easier when we're adding content into a table. All right, so those are the five different types of constraints. They're used for enforcing the type of data being added. We're trying to make sure the content's being added is not garbage. And we're enforcing we don't really garbage. it's USA. And we're enforcing it's, it's USA. USA. It's and by the way, we're going to make that table, that column, so it can't be overridden. It has to be USA or SE. <laughs> All right. So those are the idea of, of constraints that we can use when we're inserting or updating content. The other idea that we want to look at are DML triggers. And a trigger, again, is be a way for us. It could be as simple as, hey, I'm going to go in there and create a trigger on the customer table. After someone does an insert or an update, I just want to send a message. I want to raise an error. It pops up, or I can use those XP send mail. And I can send an email to the, the manager and say, hey, a new customer's been added to this table. We could use it for, for an XML, a, 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 a trigger for that. We could use a trigger for making sure the data stays consistent. And so we go in and we have a trigger on the last name column of the employee table. And that trigger is every, if there's an update on that column in that table, I want to trigger off so it goes out to accounts payable or it goes off to payroll. It also changes the last name in that table. And it goes to any other table that contains the last name. So you can also have a trigger that's assigned to one table that will trip or fire, and that will cause an update to take place on any other table. And it's, uh, there are a few things to, to kind of mention <coughs> here as well. One thing I just want to mention, we'll get into it a bit later uh, in the class, but uh, you probably want to use uh, the throw statement, which is new in SQL Server 2012, rather than the raise, uh, raise roar statement uh, that we have done here. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. But the other thing that's worth noting about triggers is the, the most common uses for triggers is really one is, uh, just like Brian mentioned, to vari uh, validate uh, some, some sort of compl more complex integrity that you can't figure out with check constraints, foreign keys, and so on, um, which is typically a, a good idea. Um, and uh, obviously, the more triggers you add, the more complexity you have, and there will, can be performance implications. The other thing that is also very common is to update denormalized data. So you have things normalized mm. first nicely and there are no duplicates anywhere. But then a common thing when you get into performance issues is, oh, maybe I'll have this column here as well. And then I don't need to join these six tables to get Correct. this result set. And then it's fairly common to use triggers to go and actually update this other column when things happen. And that can get you into trouble if there's a lot of updates or inserts or whatever you're triggering on. So it's worth considering, does it always have to be absolutely up to date? If the answer is no, you're probably better off having something like a job that runs on some uh, schedule and updates these, uh, these changes. All right, good information. The last piece we want to look at is the output clause, which is used to return information from any type of expression or uh, whenever we're performing an insert, update, or delete. Here's an example of how we would create that. Uh, notice in here we got delete sales, shopping cart item, output deleted dot asterisk. That output deleted dot asterisk specifies that all columns in the deleted rows we're gonna, are going to be returned to the application that called that delete. So in this case here, it might be just query editor that's calling that delete. And what we'll do is we'll verify in the rows that are matched with the where clause have been deleted. We'll go back afterwards. So we're going to delete sales.shopping cart item output deleted dot asterisk where shopping cart ID equal 20621. And then we'll verify that that item was deleted. Brian, 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 can I, can I show him a demo? You, I would love for you to show him a demo. Oh, thank you. So uh, actually, this output clause is this also. Is going to be in Swedish or English? Oh, good Swedish. So Sorry. then här upp, now output clause is very practical because then can man have. Uh, let's stay with the English. All right, thanks. So the update uh, or this output clause is, is super useful. It, it, it falls into, uh, you know, a bit of the same bucket as these window functions that are kind of magical. This is not uh, probably as uh, high of a bar to get into. It's just fairly easy to use, but it's super, super useful. So just the, the common example is really I update, uh, let's just say, production, uh, the product table. And 
I want to set uh, the name column into uppercase, let's say. So I'll just say upper name. And after I do this, I want to go and do something else with these particular products. You can easily get into a problem here. Let's say I had a, have a where uh, clause here and say where list price is greater than 10, right? And let's say this is a transaction, and we'll get into transactions later, but let's say I update first. And now after, I want to go and do something else with exactly these products right, that I updated. So first we increase the price, and then we'll go and do some other things with other, uh, other tables related to these products. A problem is that if I just use the same WHERE clause, if someone else inserted rows after my update that matched the WHERE clause, right, where list price is greater than 10, my update may affect 10 rows, Someone else insert the 11th row, so the next statement that goes and does something updates now uh, or manages 11 rows. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's called inconsistent analysis, and uh, uh, you need to have um, a, a different type of locking in place to protect yourself against that. But the update clause or the output clause can really help you here. So what I can do is. Um, or that's called phantom row, sorry, not, not, uh, not inconsistent analysis. So I can say, hey, output the product ID of all of these rows. And you can say into uh, like a table variable or something. Um, but let's just do this. Oh, sorry. And output inserted of product ID. So in an update, inserted will refer to the new value. And obviously, I didn't change product ID. And deleted will refer to the old value. So if I do this. Now I can see, ah, 291 rows returned, and those are exactly the products that I updated. So what I can now do is, obviously on the client side, if I just return this, I know I updated exactly these, uh, these products. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I could do is, I can say, okay, I'll have a table variable that contains this product ID column. And I can now go and do into that product ID uh, or the temp um, table variable. And now exactly these product IDs are in there. So then later in your queries, you can now start joining with this table variable and it will contain exactly those columns that you nice. or those rows that you updated. So now you don't need to worry about problems such as uh, phantom rows and you don't need to increase uh, the locking, the transaction isolation level, which could uh, basically uh, decrease uh, your chances of having good uh, concurrency. All right, outstanding. So we're going to wrap this up. We just we walked through some of the DML statements, un unlike the, what it said in the front, it's DML statements, and these included the insert, updates, deletes. We showed you different ways for inserting content, specifically with the insert into statement, the select statement, the exec statement. Uh, we talked about select into. Uh, we also told you how we could use update or merge. We've got a demo on how to use the merge for updating content. Uh, different ways for us to remove data include delete, the delete statement or the truncate table statement, uh, which can be used to delete the content or either a row. Or if you want to delete everything in a table, just use a delete without a where clause or use the truncate table option. Uh, we talked about the identity property versus the sequence property. Sequence is new in 2010 or 12. And what this will do for us is it's more of a database level sequence or a column that I can use, and I still have the seed and increment values I can set versus the identity property that's been around for a while, and that's more of a table level. But again, I can supply the seed and increment value for that. We talked about the five different types of constraints that we can use, the primary key, the foreign key, the unique, the check, and the default constraint. Uh, and then we also talked about the use of DML triggers. And uh, as uh, Tobias pointed out, we, I, we specified the use of raise error. Later on, we're going to see the throw. We're going to talk about how that would be a little bit more beneficial. So let's take about a 10-minute stretch, and we're going to uh, come back here. We'll continue our discussion into the next module, where we're going to talk about some programming elements, some error handling, and that's where we're going to introduce uh, items like the, uh, the throw and catch. So we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Enjoy the break. Mm -hmm.